he made a big crack in the floor and came spewing forth just hundreds and hundreds of ivory little carvings. So there were flowers, there were animals, there were chairs, there were deities, there were uh, kings that had been carved into these uh, ivories, but they'd all been really badly scorched. So who came to the rescue but Agatha Christie herself? She had a very expensive pot of face cream with her and <laughs> in a very interesting technique that uh, is not recommended in this building she dabbed a little handkerchief inside them and started rubbing the face cream on them now it didn't do them any harm but it didn't do them any good either and they remained scorched and they were on display up until the mid 70s but since 1975 i believe they've been kept in storage so only people who work inside the museum can go and see them unfortunately there have been huge petitions over the years from agatha christie fans and from nimrod uh, archaeologists as well to get these on display to the public but they haven't come through just yet so fingers crossed uh, there was a huge uh, push not too long ago with 75 uh, 76 thousand pounds being raised to try and restore them and it's not gone extremely well so far so they are still under lock and key down there what was the name of the city again nimrud n-i-m-r-u-d nimrud it was it in iraq or it was in modern day iraq yes I hope this, this is for the recording. I hope that's true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it should be true. Yeah. I'll be looking it up. Exactly. That's all right. I know it was around Baghdad. And I'm, but yes, modern day Iraq. It's coming back to me. It's fine. <laughs> so yes, Nimrod. Um, yes, I think that's all I'd like to say here. We're going to continue down. And our next stop will be down Shaftesbury Avenue. We're going to St. Martin's Theatre. The longest running play in the world is being staged even today. 67th. 67th year. It's been, it's been here. Uh, in the West End, since as long uh, for as long as the Queen's been on the throne. Wow! Started in 1952. Uh, I know. Now this is its second theatre. It used to be on at the uh, Ambassadors Theatre just down the road, uh, but they had to move it uh, back in. Uh, so it's been here for less than uh, minus 21 years. It's 46 years ago. So 46 years ago, they had to move it. So that's in the 70s. Uh, yes, 73. They had to move it. Sorry, that was terrible maths. I should have done that before I started talking. In 1973, the mousetrap had to move from the Ambassador's Theatre to this one, but they did it without missing a single performance. Wow. They moved it. Uh, when it closed on, uh, when the curtain came down on the Saturday night, about 10 o'clock, they got everything going. The cast were in to help. The cast's families were in to help. They hired so many stagehands, and they brought it all the way down, piece by piece, set piece by set piece, down the road into this theatre here. Now, two years ago, they uh, renovated the set again because it was the original set. It was getting a little bit rickety. Everyone was getting a little bit worried for their lives with that window coming down in the middle. Uh, so <laughs> they renovated it. But again, they did that on from the Saturday after evening onto the Sunday and then it was ready for the Monday performance. So they haven't missed a single performance. Uh, for the 60th anniversary, they had a gala performance where they had an all-star cast. It was amazing. They had... Uh, but, you know, Miranda Hart came in to play one of the characters. Harry Lloyd, they had a big cast. It was amazing. Patrick Stewart, of course. Ooh, Patrick Stewart. <laughs> Woohoo! He was in it. But before they did that, uh, they went to a opening of a memorial. Now, we're going to see that in a moment, of course. Uh, but they had to run from here because they wanted the memorial uh, to be unveiled at around 7 o'clock which is when the play should start. So they were all in costume, but they were also in uh, light coats, uh, a, no, a dark overcoat, light scarf and soft felt hats. They were all in the first the suspicious thing that everyone was seeing, so no one could tell who the murderer is. And of course, that's another huge thing. So when you see the mousetrap, they are you... sworn to secrecy. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that right? Yeah. There's a little poem at the end that the actors say to say that if you've seen it, now you are in the knowledge, now you're in the curse, and you can't say, or you'll be cursed yourself. Oh, how interesting. Now, to that reason, for that reason, rather, uh, there is a clause in this, uh, the contract of the mousetrap, saying that a film can't be made of it until it's been closed in the West End for a year. So that's never happened. Uh, <laughs> too likely, either. Uh, there's also a clause that says it can't be published in the UK until it's been closed for a few months. 
So of course, because it's never closed, technically we shouldn't have any copies of the Mousetrap available to buy in the whole of the UK. Now you're all right because in America you can find it under the title Three Blind Mice. Three Blind Mice, of course. I didn't realize that that one and the Mousetrap were the same for exactly so the long. Same. Now they were changed. Uh, it was supposed to be called Three Blind Mice. You actually hear, um, with no spoilers, uh, you actually hear the <laughs> tune Three Blind Mice uh, in the play quite a few times. But it was changed because, uh, oh, his name is Arthur Wilkins. He wrote a play in 1932 called Three Blind Mice and he was very annoyed. He said, nope, can't call it that, it's my play. So you're just nipping to the loo. Please okay. do, please do. Well, wait here, don't you worry. Uh, so he said, you, you can't have that. My play is called Three Blind Mice. And of course, his being a much more famous play, um, unfortunately for him, has been lost into the void. But yes, they are the same thing. Oh. However, there is a cheeky way, because I do own a copy of the Mousetrap script. It's not called Three Blind Mice. It's called The Mousetrap. And it was published, there are publishers in Germany and in the USA who publish it with its English title, uh, The Mousetrap, and sell it over here. So if you see an imported bookshop, head over there and you can find Agatha Christie but oh, technically interesting. that's very naughty and now the, um, the rights to the mousetrap were given uh, as a birthday present to Matthew Pritchard uh, who is Agatha Christie's only grandson, grandson yeah. mm-hmm, daughter of Rosalind Hicks of course uh, and it was his idea for the memorial that we're going to see just in a moment so he's still getting uh, all of these royalties 67 years later so a fantastic birthday present I must say uh, now, at the moment, they are, um, they've got a one-pound Levi, Levy, I can never say that word, Levy. Uh, Levy. An additional one-pound, <laughs> Levy, thank Levy. you. <laughs> never said, I'm too Welsh for that word. <laughs> uh, they've got an additional one-pound on top of every ticket price, and that one-pound goes in its entirety to charities supporting uh, theatrical families, so people, you know, single parents who have children, but they're working in the theatre and the children need care, that kind of thing. Um, so, still doing very, very good things. And we can see as well, we've got the cast list out here. Now that's very, uh, it's not unheard of, but it's fairly unusual in the West End. Usually you get the few stars, uh, and their names are on there, and then nobody else gets a listing, they just get in the programme. However, because we don't know who the murderer is, everyone's oh. suspect. You've got every single name there. And if you do go and research them, I'm sure you'll find a couple of RADA graduates who have just finished who want to go in there. Uh, Now, over 67 years, there have, of course, been many, many actors. Uh, There's one lady, her name is Maggie, and I can never remember her last name. I want to call her Smith. It's not Maggie Smith. It's a different Maggie. Uh, She served as a understudy for 40 years. (gasps) So she's going on. There is an original cast member as well. The original gentleman who played the colonel, uh, the major, excuse me, Major Metcalf. Uh, his voice can still be heard in one of the 67 performances. So well done, to uh, I think that's about it. I always want to talk a lot more on this bit, but I think that's okay. I will- you can see Ben Twiston Davis and the date uh, 2012. That was the artist, and that's where it's put up. And this was uh, the brainchild of uh, Stephen Whaley Cohen. I always get that name wrong. I want to call him Whaley Steve. Uh, Stephen Whaley Cohen, who's one of the producers of The Mousetrap, and her grandson, Matthew Pritchard. So they decided they were going to have this memorial right in the middle of Covent Garden, and they got Ben Twiston Davis, the artist, to come and do it. Now they've got her dates, of course, and the book. Uh, Just a little nod to her being the third most... uh, published author in the world, just the Bible, and Shakespeare, as I said before. Uh, and we've got lots of information as well. So all of the two billion copies in a hundred languages is something they love to say. It's also been in Braille, in Latin, lots and lots of languages like that. Any language you can think of, Agatha has got a book out in it, at least one. And over on the other side as well, we're going to walk just around the other side and then I'll give you loads of time to read it all. There's lots and lots of information. On the other side, we've got, you'll be thrilled to see, the Joan Hickson version of Miss Marvel. Oh, of course. And a very clear David Suchet as well. So they're meant to be the characters, but of course they've been influenced by who has played them on screen. We've also got Greenways up there, uh, her house in Devon, attached to our typewriter. And we've got a little character up there. Word is still out on whether it's Hastings at the end of Curtain or whether it's Pyro himself revealing. Oh, I won't say that. Uh, We've also got the Orient Express. We've got uh, the pyramids as well, lots of things happening in Green Egypt, and a few clouds. Now, I love those clouds because they, uh, well, for me at least, are a very veiled little uh, reference to death in the clouds. It's one of my very favorite. Oh, okay, yeah. So I like that they've got those as well. That might be just me reading into it, 
but I do quite like it. Uh, there's lots more information, and all this is available in lots and lots of different languages. There's a little uh, QR code, right I notice. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's very modern on a, on a, on a, on a, a QR code. A QR code on you can a memorial. Scan it in <laughs> and you get taken to the website immediately. There's lots and lots of information there. It's amazing. So if you do want to take any photos. Now this blue is building. Up Which one? Sorry? Where's the blue one? This one's one here, kind of bluey grey. Oh, the grey, okay, yeah. Blue to my eyes, grey to other people's eyes. I'm not picking the blue grey. Um, so that is the Detection Club. Now that was set up in 1930 by Dorothy L. Sayers, Agatha Christie, and Anthony Berkeley Cox. I'll say that again Anthony Berkeley Cox. We've got an ABC. Oh. Now that was set up by the three of them, uh, not in protest of the Garrett Club, but as an addition to. So the three of them, uh, they wanted to collect the greatest crime writers they possibly could and have a club and a space where they could all write together, share their plot ideas, do all sorts of things like that. And this is where they chose. Now it is still running today, of course. Uh, it's flourishing. There are loads and loads of crime writers nowadays and detective novelists. So they do come here every now and again, but now it's more of an online uh, secret society, that kind of thing. However, back in the day, uh, they were all very, very good friends. And when Agatha Christie went missing in 1927, she'd had a terrible year, of course. Her mother had died earlier that year. And on the 4th of December, her husband, Archie, left the family home to go and spend Christmas with Nancy Neal, his mistress. And she went missing. Quarter to ten that night, she went entirely missing. No one could find out where she was. Uh, she left a letter saying that she was going to Yorkshire. But then they found her car in a quarry with an out-of-date driver's license, some clothes in the back. It was all very mysterious. Clues. Where had she gone? <laughs> so many clues. Now, the, the police thought exactly the same thing. They thought, well, all her best friends are crime writers. Bring them in. So Arthur oh, Conan Doyle, he came along. He had a glove of Agatha Christie's and he gave it to a medium. Oh my medium goodness. medium came up with nothing. Oh, well <laughs> done. She, she led them on a wild goose chase. Didn't work at all. So Arthur Conan Doyle, he's out. None of that. Uh, they asked Dorothy L. Sayers as well, one of her uh, co-founders of the Detection Club, and she spent three hours looking at the car. So she examined all the food, she examined absolutely everything. And at the end of three hours, she walked straight over to the police officer and said, she isn't here. <laughs> there was nothing they could do. Turns out fictional crime writers not very good at solving real crimes. Uh, unfortunately for them. Now she was found two days after the Great Sunday Hunt. That was on the, twen uh, the 12th of December that year. Uh, and they had 2,000 civilians out looking for Agatha Christie. It was a huge news story, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, yeah. So they had people not only coming to help find Agatha Christie, but they had lots of people who sold food and drinks from the back of a van come up as well. So they made a great deal of money up in Yorkshire. And they finally found her on the 14th of December, two days after that big manhunt. Uh, she was in a spa and she signed in very dramatically under the name of Nancy Neal, her mm. husband's mistress. Right. You're going to disappear, why not do it in a yeah. big flamboyant style, of course. Uh, yeah, so that was her big disappearing act. Now that, of course, has been under huge debate, and she never referred to it in her autobiography. Biographers have had a field day with it, but people do think that she might have been suffering from amnesia, that she genuinely couldn't remember what happened. Yeah. My personal theory is that she might have um, gone with the intention of giving her husband a bit of a own medicine, yes. and decided yeah, that's what I think. not to it yet. That's or, what I think. No, we will never know, but... That's what I think happened. Fantastic lady for dealing with things in her own way. Marvelous. So, we're going to leave the detection club now and we're going to head over to where she definitely did do a lot of her writing. We're going to the London Library. Buildings. It's huge. They've got around 14 and a half miles of bookcase inside this building and they're adding around half a mile more bookcase every year. <gasps> now, they never throw a book away. No matter what state it's in, they will restore it, they will bring it back to life, and they will house it somewhere inside there. Now it came about, this is the first of our modern libraries, the way that we think about libraries now. Hopefully, uh, yes, seven. Oh, it doesn't say, marvellous, so I can just tell you. Uh, it was 1871, Thomas Carlyle, a historian, he decided 
that he'd had enough of libraries. He hated libraries. Victorian libraries, nothing like libraries we know today. Uh, they were noisy. You weren't allowed to take books out. It was a terrible place to try and work. And Sir Thomas Carlyle had enough of it. He set up his own, the London Library. Now, inside here, there's a huge rule. You cannot speak. You can sign in. It's a members-only library. It's about £700 per year. Um, but when you go in... Uh, you're allowed to speak to the receptionist, you can check out books, check them back in, have a little laugh. Once you go through the second set of doors just on the other side, there is no talking. Now they do do free guided tours inside, so if you do want to go, I think they run Monday evenings. Um, and a few others, it's all available on their website, so don't take my word for it. Uh, they do uh, some free guided tours, you can go and see all the nooks and crannies, that kind of thing. Uh, and recently they had a production of Dracula inside there as well. So uh, for a few nights a week they'd shut down the whole library, tell everyone there's going to be a lot of noise happening now I'm afraid, and they had a big production of Dracula inside there. Now that's because one of the authors well known for working in here is Bram Stoker. We've also got Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he did lots of writing in here of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he even sent Dr. Watson uh, in one of the stories to come and learn all about Chinese pottery. In the I remember library. that one, yeah. And then by the next week, he'd forgotten all. So he has to come over here. He's trying to help out Sherlock with a blackmailer. Yeah. Comes on in here. Uh, we've also got Virginia Woolf, she wrote in here. Uh, also, if you do, if you are a Virginia Woolf fan, you can go and see a dictionary inside there where her fingerprint is right next to a very naughty word beginning with the letter F. She looked it up in a dictionary and said, ha, ah, someone's defined it. Uh, Harold Pinter wrote in there as well, Charles Dickens and Charles Darwin's, both the Charleses, and Agatha Christie as well. She was a member here for a great many years while she was living here in London. Uh, she lived in Ealing for a little while. She visited there as a child for quite a lot. Uh, that's where her step-grandmother lived with all of her cronies from Ealing, who uh, <laughs> were the inspiration for Miss Marple as well. Um, she also lived in Chelsea, she lived in Sheffield Terrace down in Chelsea. She lived all over the place in London, especially with Max Malawan. So when they were in Britain, when they were in London, this is where she'd come, just for a little bit of quiet time. Maybe if Senate House Library was getting a little bit too rowdy. Uh, but it's an absolutely gorgeous building, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, maybe not to be a full member, that's quite expensive. Um, but those free tours are absolutely cool. They've got lots of those Beauty and the Beast style uh, rolling ladders as well which are very uh, okay. exciting yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love those. what a historic little place and also we can't leave here without referencing Quiro now he himself did not come to the London Library unfortunately not to go inside but we do find Inspector Jap and Hastings and Hercule himself I never know which one this is because it starts on an odd little bit I think it's this coming from the markets, they'd eat their oysters and they'd throw the shells in this little alleyway here and it stank, it was absolutely horrible. So he decided he wanted to do something for enterprising ladies. So he built an arcade here, there are 47 shops, 47 places that you can set up store and they were all meant to be for industrious ladies willing to make a good day's work. Now three of those uh, shops were taken up by ladies. Uh, the rest of them were taken up by milliners and dressmakers, all of whom were male, but because of their profession, they were referred to as madame. So technically, they got through. Oh, so, wow. Mm -hmm, there are 44 gentlemen and three of the industrious ladies who were meant to have. Now, as you can see, there are quite a few rules inside here. One of them, you can't smoke inside here. Uh, we have a door as well, in his little cape and his hat. Uh, and you might notice we've got some gates as well. Right. Now those gates are here because we've had two very big crimes here. You'll notice that most of these shops are jewellery shops. There's even uh, the only shop here that does the Victoria Cross. They're here on this arcade as well. So extremely valuable things here on this. Now, one of them in 1942 uh, or 46, I'm checking out. Um, <laughs> There was a fire here, 1936, there was a fire here, and people started looting. They looted the whole thing. Tens of thousands of pounds of things were stolen, uh, and back in the 30s, of course, it's a huge amount of money. Uh, so they couldn't get everything back, and still lots of those items are still missing. Probably, they've presumably been melted down into other things and sold off that way. Now, in the 60s, this is my favorite one, a Jaguar 
was driven down this arcade. They stopped about halfway through, broke into a jewellery shop, stole everything they could carry, and just reversed out again, and they were never caught. It's <gasps> one of the most audacious jewel thefts I can possibly think of. I absolutely love that story. So, they've got these gates here. Now, one of the uh, other big rules here is that you're not allowed to whistle. You can walk up and down here all day, every day, you will hear nobody whistling. And if you are, you'll be asked to stop by that doorman. Now that's because that used to be a signal for thieves. They wanted to whistle to each other, then they'd know which shop they were at, what they could do, so not allowed to do it. Except for one person back in the 70s, someone, oh, 60s, excuse me, somebody was walking down here, they had long hair, they were whistling away, the doorman went over and went, excuse me sir, he turned around, it was John Lennon. I <laughs> thought, well, fair enough, people whistle, that's fine. So, John Lennon's allowed to whistle here, and nobody else is, unfortunately. <laughs> However, we do see this arcade, uh, they could have used Quiro in a couple of those looting and uh, all those kind of things because we do see it in Quiro a couple of times. The 